Cars have four wheels, right? F1 is a car racing series, therefore F1 cars have four wheels, right? Well, for the past 45 years, this has been true. However, the most complicated and probably the most interesting car ever made for the apex of motorsport does not follow this seeming rule. So what are we talking about here? Six-wheel Formula One cars? No, we aren't smoking something. This happened during the 70s, and it was called the Tyrrell P34. Now, why in the world would a Formula One car have six wheels? Four wheels seems to be more than enough, unless your name is Fernando Alonso and you're driving in Baku in 2019, in which case two wheels is plenty. But why six? Well, the man who designed it, Derek Gardner, designed it so his team, Tyrrell, would be able to get an unfair advantage. You see, in the 1970s, the F1 field was much more even than it is today. The field back then were all supplied by Cosworth and used the same engine. They used the same Goodyear tires and used the same gearbox made by Hewland. Derek Garner decided to make his team stand out. He did some calculations and concluded that having six wheels on the car, four in the front and two in the back, would improve the aerodynamics of the car by creating less front lift and would improve the traction of the car because, well, more wheels, obviously. Garner said in an interview that his findings equaled an extra 40-odd horsepower just like that. When he came to his boss, three-time world champion Jackie Stewart, with a design idea, Jackie nearly choked on his coffee. Ken Tyrrell, team owner though, trusted his engineer and greenlit the project, and so the story of the six-wheeled F1 car began. According to Jody Schechter, F1 world champion and, at the time, Tyrrell driver, the project was kept very secret. It was kept so secret, in fact, that not even he or his teammate Patrick DePaler knew anything about the development of the car. The only people outside of Tyrrell who knew about the development of the six-wheeler were the folks over at Goodyear. They were tasked with making the smaller wheels for the front. Engineering-wise, it's probably the most complicated car ever made. Because it has six wheels, its suspension, aero and monocoque are all tailored for that. The suspension is connected directly to the steering system, and both of the front wheels have to turn. So the suspension and steering have to accommodate for not only one, but two sets of wheels turning, in order for it to be stable and drivable. So, the mechanisms of the steering had to double. This obviously made the car weigh much more. It is not shocking then that the car weighs much more than a regular F1 car at the time, and its advancement in 1977 weighs almost 40 kilograms more than its competitors. Another part of the car that I alluded to earlier as being specially engineered were the front tires. They are to be small enough to fit in the limited space, but still large enough in order to provide the necessary amount of grip for the car. Goodyear was given this thankless task and managed to create wheels for the front of the car that were 10 inches in diameter and were much smaller than the regular wheels used for F1 cars at the time. This was because, in order to abide by the regulations of Formula 1, the front wheel well had to be a certain size, so the wheels had to be made smaller. Of course, Tyrrell was the only team to run a six-wheel configuration in an F1 race ever, so the design didn't really catch on and had more than a few issues. The first issue was the fact that the car's biggest problem was its braking performance. It was originally thought that the car's six-brake calipers would aid in braking performance, and this was true. They did in fact help, as the car was able to slow down and stop faster than its competitors, and coupled with the car's better turn-in, it was a monster turning into corners. However, the brakes were the main downfall of the car, especially the front brakes. Due to the fact that they were made to fit the regulation of Formula 1 at the time, the wheels were small, 10 inches like we already mentioned. This meant that the front brake calipers of the P34 were susceptible to malfunctioning. This was obvious from the P34's first race, as Jody Schechter brought the car to P3 on the grid, but ended up finishing 11th due to the car's brakes overheating and costing him valuable time due to him having to brake earlier and more gently into corners. The drivability of the P34 was also hampered, again by its tires. Because the front two tires were much smaller than the rear two, they rotated more at the same speed. More revs per minute of the front tires meant that those tires wore out faster than the rear tires. And in the 70s, refueling wasn't allowed, and pit stops weren't mandated by the rules as they are today. So drivers would have to massage and care for the same tires from the beginning till the end of the race in order for them not to puncture. This was difficult for the drivers to do, because even though the car was very fast in the beginning, it was much slower than all of the other cars by the end of the race. This is strange for a Formula 1 car, because in general, a Formula 1 car is faster as the race draws to an end and the fuel load burns down, thus making the car lighter and more nimble. 
This was not the case for the P-34 as much as it was for the other cars. The other problems came not only from the drivability of the P-34, but from its development. Because of the P-34's overheating issues with its brakes, the engineers spent most of their time developing solutions for that issue. This was a gamble that didn't really pay off because the car's braking issues were never really fixed and the brakes kept overheating, admittedly afterwards to a lesser degree, until the end of the car's lifespan in 1977. But the development of clever cooling solutions also hampered the car's development in other areas, thus keeping the car at a developmental standstill. Another problem the car engineers ran into were, again, the front tires. Goodyear was the only tire provider of the Formula One field at the time, similar to how Pirelli is today, and the Tyrrell team was the only team using the 10-inch wheels made by Goodyear, and the people at Goodyear didn't have the resources or the time to develop small 10-inch wheels needed for the car to drive. These factors really stacked the deck against six-wheelers in Formula One and really made it an uphill battle for Tyrrell to keep the car running in the field and to keep it competitive. But the issue was that even though the car was fast from the beginning, it just got slower as time went on, and the development of the two cars being focused on the cooling and drivability of the cars meant that the car only kept losing pace against the rest of the field. However, the P-34 did have its day in the sun. In the 1976 Swedish Grand Prix, the Tyrrell team had a wonderful Saturday, as Jody Schechter put the six-wheeler on pole position with a 1 minute 26.6 second lap time, even breaking the Scandinavian raceway track record in the process. The race only really had one standout moment, as Mario Andretti on second illegally overtook Jody Schechter, who was on pole, before the backmarkers took their place on the grid. This meant that he was hit with a one-minute time penalty, and Jody was given the lead and eventually the win of the race. The race was historic only because it was the first and so far only Grand Prix to have ever been won by a six-wheeled Formula One car. The concept of a six-wheeler is something that didn't die with the P-34, though, as when it stopped running, other teams, most notably Williams, attempted to develop but, in the end, never ended up running a car with six wheels. So tell us down in the comments, what do you think? Are six-wheelers a thing of the past, or are they a concept that you would like to see in Formula One or any other racing series? Let us know in the comments below.